let's go right away in the next talk uh, with Christian Paquet. He's a crypto Paquet, pardon. Christian Paquet. He's a crypto specialist in Microsoft Research Security and crypto Cryptography team. He's currently involved in projects related to post quantum cryptography, such as the Open Quantum Safe project. He's also leading the development of the UProof technology. He is also interested in privacy enhancing technologies, smart cloud encryption, uh, and the intersection of AI and security. Prior to joining Microsoft in 2008, he was the chief security engineer at Credentica, a crypto developer at Silanis Technology, working on digital signature systems, and a security engineer at Zero Knowledge Systems, working on Tor-like systems. So give a good round of applause again for Christian Paquin on his talk on Stay Quantum Safe, Future Proofing Encrypted Secrets. All right, hello everybody. Uh, it's good to be back virtually in Montreal. I'm a Montreal native and a native uh, French speaker. So if you detect some accent, uh, that's the reason. Um, so today, we, uh, I mean, we are staying COVID-19 safe by, by doing this virtually, which is a great idea. And um, I will explain how to stay quantum safe as well. And uh, the goal of the, the presentation is to explain how to um, <clears throat> future-proof our encryption um, systems um, to defend against the quantum computer. So um, as it was said, my name is Christian uh, and I work for Microsoft Research. Well, since uh, well, I like to talk about me, let me talk a little bit more about me. Um, <clears throat> I, um, we've, we've all been hearing about quantum computers lately. They're all over the news. Well, in fact, I've been hearing about this for a, a long time. I was a young student here at the University of Montreal uh, almost 25 years ago, and that's where we studied uh, quantum cryptography and trying to build this, these new things that promise to revolutionize the world of, of cryptography and, and computing. Uh, after that, I joined a, a more uh, practical side of the industry. I became a crypto engineer, worked uh, for many years until I landed a little bit more than 10 years ago uh, at Microsoft. And I'm currently uh, in the crypto and security team where uh, at MSR, where we will work on cutting edge cryptography, things that will end up in products in um, you know, five to 10 years. And our current uh, focus is uh, post-quantum cryptography, which is the subject of this talk. Uh, I was here uh, last year at NSEC to present uh, on the subject. So the goal uh, of this year's presentation is to give an update uh, on what happened in, uh, in the field and uh, what can be done to start migrating our systems to post-quantum cryptography. We've, uh, we've heard about the, the quantum revolution and the promises that this magical computer will have uh, on the field of computing. Using uh, the special properties of quantum mechanics, computers that built uh, with such properties could magically calculate all sorts of parallel um, computations uh, at the same time, resulting in algorithms that are impossible to implement on normal classical computers. So um, there's a lot of R&D around the globe uh, on this, trying to realize the vision of this quantum computer. In fact, I have some colleagues at MSR that are building both the, uh, the actual physical stack, uh, the, the quantum gates, and I have some other colleagues building um, quantum software you can download a, a QKD, a quantum development kit for Visual Studio and start programming in Q Sharp uh, to implement these quantum algorithms. So now they, they could be just, um, as, now they're, they would be simulated on a normal computer, but as soon as we can plug in one of these quantum computer, uh, the same software would work. So for all of you aspiring uh, quantum hackers, I mean, that you should start to learn these things now. Um, so one big problem for the field of security is that uh, quantum computers completely break the, our existing cryptography. Indeed, in 1994, Peter Shore developed his uh, famous algorithm that allows to factor uh, and find a discrete Lagardian of, of large number, uh, large numbers. So essentially breaking the RSA and ECDSA algorithms that also it's valid for Diffie-Hellman and the elliptic curve variance. 
There's also another famous algorithm called the Grover algorithm that breaks uh, some symmetric primitives such as ash functions and, and um, blocks, block ciphers like AES, but not in a catastrophic way. It improves the attack. And by simply doubling these primitives, we're, we're able to resist a quantum computer. So this is less of an issue. But for asymmetric primit uh, primitives, um, like asymmetric encryption and signatures, it's, it's a terrible result and essentially breaks um, most of the protocols we use on the internet today. So you can say bye to your HTTPS TLS connections and your SSH connections to your servers, uh, your certificates, your uh, update channels that are using uh, signed um, messages, your, your, your private communications like Signal, and even your Bitcoins, all gone if a quantum computer is built. And there's, there's different opinions on a, when will this be um, implemented. Some say uh, five years, some say never, or you know, a longer time. But there's a big uh, consensus around a, a, a quite serious possibility that these could appear within a decade or two. And being security practitioners, we have to take this kind of worst case scenario in mind in order to migrate to a quantum safe cryptography. That is uh, using changing our, our base algorithms to to rely on problems that we don't know how to break with a quantum computer. And one question is why would we want to do that now? Why can't we wait in 10, 15 years? Like we end old in you know, Y2K, if you're old enough to remember, just do it the year before and, and panic and we'll be safe. Well, the problem is that the data that we exchange today on the internet is at risk because it can be captured and decrypted later with the help of a quantum computer. So if you have long lived data, uh, that, or data that has a, 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 uh, a long lived threat model and needs to be secure for multiple years, you have to take that into consideration. Another point is that um, these cryptographic algorithms are used in protocols like TLS, SSH, et cetera. And these take a long time to update. They are designed by committees and we need to define new extensions and agree on them so that they can be used in an interoperable fashion on the internet. And also, um, <clears throat> new quantum safe algorithms uh, would behave differently than the RSAs and the DSAs that we know. Uh, some could have longer keys and message signature sizes. They could take uh, longer to run. And we don't even know if the code that we want to modify is easily modifiable. When we transition from uh, MD5 to SHA-1 to SHA-2, uh, we found some, a lot of horror stories in some code bases where these things were so hard coded that update was difficult. So when you run the clock backward, taking in account your threat model time and the time it would take to change infrastructure, you get a date of when you need to start this transition. And for many use cases, uh, this date could very well be uh, yesterday. Fortunately, uh, crypt cryptographers are on top of this. Uh, NIST, which is the uh, National Institute of Standard and Technology, uh, this, this US body that dictates uh, the, the crypto primitives used by the US government. Uh, it, it is also a de facto standard organization for the world because most of the NIST uh, standards are adopted uh, around the globe. So they, uh, in two, um, 2017, they made a call for a, a new set of algorithms that could resist the quantum computers. And we we're last at the beginning of the of last year, we they went into a round two where the 69 proposal in a Thanos type fashion got reduced to a, a a smaller subset of these 26 remaining, and some of them got merged together. And we are now just at the we're expecting very soon this summer the announcement of a round three. Uh, survivors of, uh, of all these algorithms. So we expect a smaller list. Um, and in two to four years, we're expecting new draft standards uh, that would uh, make these algorithms standards and available for, for the industry. So the question for us now, or dealing with integrating algorithms or have protocols and, and services that use cryptography is, 
how can we get ready? And more importantly, what about the data that works today? Should we uh, ignore these few years or can we do something today to mitigate the quantum risk? Well, there's a lot, a lot many things can be done today and that's what I'm gonna discuss uh, in this presentation. So we joined this uh, open source project called the Open Quantum Safe project where we offer a framework integrating multiple uh, multiple quantum algorithms from the NIST competition. And this allows us to make some experiments and study them in, in various environments. So as you can see from the list here, it's a, a um, big industry and uh, academic collaboration project. It's led by the University of Waterloo. And we've have, we've integrated the OpenSSL library into different applications and TLS, SSH, and VPN, for example, through forks uh, from the, the popular boring SSL, OpenSSL projects and OpenSSH and OpenVPN. We also have some wrappers in different languages. Uh, if you're interested to use uh, OQS in C++ or C Sharp, Go, Java, or Python, uh, we have these wrappers available as well. So the, um, um, the openquantumsafe.org project allows you to uh, to get uh, all these uh, links and, and to learn more about the project. So the main thing I'd like to discuss today are the result of two studies we did uh, using the OQS project. The first one uh, deals with integrating the, the post quantum cryptography in TLS and SSH. So we, we wanted to see what would be the impact of, of changing uh, these algorithms and specifically how to integrate it in a hybrid scenario. I'll discuss that in a second, what that means. So we did that. Uh, I'll talk now about the results in OpenSSL and OpenSSH for TLS and SSH. <clears throat> so a hybrid scenario uh, essentially mixes both a classical uh, algorithm with a post-quantum one. The trust we get uh, with uh, quantum, uh, with sorry crypto algorithms comes with time. The reason we 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 uh, we believe this in the security of RSA is because it's been a long, a long time. It's been around since 1976. A lot of people tried to break it, and nobody uh, was able to. Uh, no, not until a quantum computer comes around. Uh, these new uh, post-quantum proposals, uh, some of them are very new. So even if uh, we don't know how to break it with a, a quantum computer today, uh, it doesn't mean that we won't be able to do it in 10 years. In fact, we could break it with a normal or a classical computer. We don't, we don't even know. So one strategy is to try to get the best of both worlds, to combine the security of our classical scheme uh, let's say RSA or ECDHE and combine it with a post quantum one. And the resulting uh, key that we use on, on the wire is secure if any one of them is secure. These protocols, uh, when, when you do a TLS connection, you don't use your, your ECDHE or RSA key directly to encrypt the message. You use it to derive a, a, a secure and quick, fast, uh, symmetric encryption key, like an AES key that you use to, uh, to do your encryption uh, of each packet. So we would do the same in the hybrid fashion and have a, a both a classical and a post-quantum input to the key derivation function to, to result in the AES key that would be based on the security of both schemes. So fortunately, we're able in TLS and SSH to uh, negotiate algorithms, but we don't have the ability to negotiate two different algorithms and use them in conjunctions. So, uh, we, uh, the paper explores different ways to do that. Um, one way is to uh, just invent a new scheme. Instead of saying, I'm going to use ECDHE and I'm going to use Psyche together, Psyche is a post-quantum algorithm, I'm going to use a new algorithm called ECDHE Psyche. And for the TLS layer, it's completely uh, oblivious to the fact that under the cover in the crypto layer, we're separating these two things and, and doing both ECDHE and site computations in parallel and combining the results. So it's a great approach that it's easy to implement without changing uh, the protocol or the implementation, but it's uh, 
uh, doesn't get, give you a lot of flexibility for negotiating uh, different variants. Uh, and alternatively, we could define new hybrid approaches that requires changes to the protocol uh, through extensions. Uh, when you, you consider all these options, you, you have to uh, think about the compatibil backward compatibility, performance, latency. You don't want to introduce new uh, data flows, new messages. You don't want to break old hardware implementing TLS protocol, for example. Um, so for our implementation we we use the uh, naive approach the first one where we define new combo algorithms to uh, allow us to do a quick implementation without changing uh, anything in the protocol so we were able to integrate in the key share tls 1.3 extension i'm just going to concentrate on tls 1.3 we also add uh, some code in tls 1.2 but um kind of <clears throat> Forward-looking, let's talk about TLS 1.3. So the results were quite positive. Um, some crypto algorithms are a bit too big to fit in the TLS, which, which has uh, uh, limits on the public key and signature sizes. Um, and OpenSSL, its implementation, also uh, constrains things further down. Uh, but by modifying the code, we're able to fit most of our integrations, uh, our, our our algorithms, and I'll discuss that in a second. And we're able to use this OpenSSL uh, modified version of OpenSSL uh, to stand up uh, Nginx and Apache servers uh, to test uh, our, our modified clients as well. Um, the, this uh, GitHub link here, uh, it's also everything's available from the open source, openquantumsafe.org project that, that I showed at the beginning. Uh, just shows you uh, that if you're if you know how to use OpenSSL, then you can use it exactly the same way to stand up a test client and server with these new post quantum hybrid algorithms. In this case, Frodo and and, ECD, uh, and ECDHE with the P two fifty six NIST curve, and using a, a ECDSA and Q Tesla hybrid certificate there, and then you get the connection. Everything works uh, as expected. So we also had uh, another part of the, the paper was to discuss SSH. Uh, SSH is kind of more the same, so I'll, I'll skip over it. Um, it's, it's another key exchange uh, protocol with authentication, and we're able to provide both hybrid uh, classical and post-quantum key exchange and authentication as well. And again, if you're aware of how to, how to uh, use SSH, you'll notice that uh, we can use it in exactly the same way. You can take our fork and, and install it on a server and start uh, connecting to it using uh, hybrid post-quantum security. So the interesting thing about uh, what we observe, as I said, is that most quantum algorithms were able to be integrated. Uh, some of them with the, the yellow check mark just means that we had to modify um, some of the uh, of the code in OpenSSL to allow bigger structures. That was just a uh, uh, implementation choice of the OpenSSL uh, designers to, to limit that. And some scheme, uh, for example, NTS, which is a, a code base, which use a very large uh, artifacts in there that we were not able to fit them. But for most of them, it was okay. For signatures, uh, a lot of signatures use quite big uh, artifacts as well, keys or, or, or signatures. And we had to update, modify the OpenSSL and OpenSSH code to make the work. And very few of the algorithms we tested were not able to fit. So Picnic, for example, Picnic version one, uh, the higher level, level three and five uh, wouldn't fit. But in the, the second round, Picnic two version, they, they did modify uh, the algorithm and we were able to fit them in TLS and only the, the rainbow signature uh, algorithm, we were not able to fit it in the SSH code base. So very positive. Overall, these new schemes fit well into uh, the, our target protocols, TLS and SSH. The other thing we wanted to consider was uh, the benchmarking. So how, how efficient these algorithms would be in, in real life. And the second, second paper, uh, you, uh, we, 
we designed two uh, experiments. The first one, we use a um, uh, the uh, network emulator uh, as part of the Linux kernel to um, to, uh, to connect two uh, virtual Ethernet um, endpoints, one a client using the OpenSSL S time connecting to a server that was uh, that we instantiated with Nginx. And the nice thing about the network emulator is that you're able to change its behavior. So we added a different uh, runtime, um, different distance between the, these two endpoints, and also changed the packetless probability from zero to 20% in multiple clicks. So uh, I apologize, the screen is very small. Uh, the point is not to, to see the details of, of each result, but just to, to show the, the, the trend. And um, what we observe is that for most algorithms on good networks, uh, the performance was quite good. We compared the state-of-the-art ECDHC uh, connection algorithm with a, a hybrid version of itself with three different post-quantum algorithms. And most of them had uh, very similar performance. Uh, and what we observe is that for uh, uh, algorithms with larger keys, for example, then they would have to be split across multiple packets when they're, uh, they would be to be fragmented. And if the packet loss probability is higher than 5%, then there's a good chance that some data would need to be resent and, um, and that would slow things down for these algorithms. Um, so yeah, so uh, overall good, good news and good simulation for, for the usage of hybrid um, exchanges compared to the pure ECDH. The second result, we tried to uh, emulate uh, something, not emulate, the first one did the emulation, but the second one, we tried to simulate real life conditions by having uh, a client uh, in virtual machine connected to four different uh, virtual machines across uh, the planet in different data centers and trying to retrieve uh, various size web pages from 1K to 10 to 100 to 100K to one megabyte. And some surveys we looked at uh, put the average web size to uh, two to three megabytes. So having a, a one megabyte limit gave us a good approximation. And so not surprisingly, when we try to fetch these different pages across uh, these different VMs, we noticed that, you know, of course, the, the further away uh, you're connecting to and the larger the web page, um, uh, connection slows down. But what's interesting is that ECDHE with an ECDSA certificate, um, is, its performance is not that much better than the same thing in a hybrid combination with a post-quantum algorithm as things you know gets further away and, and with bigger web pages. So the more we look with real life conditions, the amortized cost of adding this extra layer of post-quantum security does not penalize you too much which is good news um, for uh, if you want to try to uh, deploy these technologies today and start experimenting with them. So you get a lot of protection, basically a, a safety net against quantum computers for the data that's exchanged today for a very uh, adequate uh, performance cost. So these are good news for, for experimenters and deployers. So the last uh, project I'd like to discuss today is the uh, old, uh, VPN tunnel that uh, we, we played with. So we have an integration into OpenVPN through our OpenSSL fork because OpenVPN bases security on TLS. And this is a, a nice scenario for uh, both legacy applications and for clients that would be difficult to update like uh, IoT devices that have a long lifespan. So it would be hard to magically transform all these, these devices and, and clients uh, to, uh, to make them quantum secure. So one way to, to do this is to leave them untouched and simply add a uh, post-quantum tunnel and, and tunnel their, their communication through it. So uh, you get the quantum safety automatically without having to change uh, what's going on on the wire. <clears throat> and 
we, uh, we experimented with this approach in a, a real life scenario. So one, uh, there's one of our sister team at Microsoft Research uh, is working on Project Natick, which is a, an underwater data center module that, that floats, or well, not floats, but <laughs> is in the, the ocean uh, at, on the North uh, Sea of Scotland. And the reason to experiment with these is that it brings data closer to the customer and there's some inherent uh, cooling benefits to be in the water like this. And we ran a, a post quantum VPN to it from our Redmond at headquarters. Um, and, and just use, with normal rekeying and, and everything. Um, and we ran this for, for a long time. The details are in this uh, URL here. And what's, what's interesting is that uh, this experiment kind of gives us confidence that uh, we're ready to, to start experimenting with, with post quantum deployments with uh, real life data. So this, this is a test data center, so it's not real uh, customer data. So we're kind of, uh, we, we're, we're allowed to, to experiment with this uh, without putting anybody in danger. And also, as you can see, uh, the little seal on the water there, that picture was taken from a webcam outside the data center. It's not easy to send a technician down there to, to fix uh, something. If, and the fact that we're able to uh, to do this experiment gives us confidence that the techniques we use uh, could be replicated in, in normal data centers. So um, that brings us to uh, to the end of this uh, presentation. What uh, and uh, I hope that you uh, you you got to the message that quantum computers are are coming. Uh, and that's the safe standpoint to, to take as a, a, if you work in security and cryptography, because uh, the costs would be high if you're, if you're wrong and, and don't expect them. And there are uh, things we can do today to protect the data uh, that, that's on the wire uh, this instant. And we need to start, start thinking about transitioning to quantum safe. There's a few things that uh, we can do today uh, before we wait for new standards. Uh, and I hope that the various projects that uh, I presented uh, give you a good start. And we're always happy to hear some feedback, get some contribution in these uh, open source projects. Uh, either uh, you're a photographer, a, a practitioner, or an enthusiast would like to integrate these into your project. So please feel free to uh, communicate, communicate with me if you have some, some questions or ask your questions. So thank you very much. Okay, so let's go with the first question. Um, will Microsoft support the winner of round three in its mainstream products when most popular only or even some legacy, but still supported OS? Um, I, I can speak uh, on behalf of the Microsoft product teams, which will have their own decision making in there, but I just assume that, um, that Microsoft will, will follow the, the industry. In fact, we we have my colleagues at MSR. We have four of these schemes in uh, in 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 the competition. So of course we we have like <laughs> our favorites, and we're experimenting with these more than some others. But uh, the the Microsoft uh, you know servers and teams and Edge, which is based now on, on Chrome, would would just work in in collaboration with the industry to pick the winners. I know Google did some experiments and uh, with Cloudflare and then um, we'll see what, what emerged there. Yeah, it's tricky. But, yeah. Um, Quantum... Microsoft, sorry, Microsoft Vision. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> uh, do quantum computing break perfect forward secrecy as well, PFS? So yes, so uh, I've been, I mentioned a lot of RSA and ECDHE, so RSA is not perfect secrecy, you break it once and you, you can back uh, break all the history of the communication that was done with that key. ECDHE uses a which is ephemeral defilement, <coughs> EC, well, elliptic curve defilement. Uh, you need to uh, to break every renegotiation with it, but if you store it today, you can, if you have access to a quantum computer later, you can break any of these rekeying. So yes, it breaks it. Okay, good. Um, 
Bitcoin question. You say Charles algorithm is a threat to Bitcoin. Doesn't it apply only to signature verification of new transactions, but Merkle tree remains immutable? Well, um, so, I mean, wherever you use, I know that some Bitcoin uses the, um, was it DSA or ECDSA? I'm not a Bitcoin expert, but um, it's um, whatever that part, <laughs> Uh, that part would be broken. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure what's the impact on the Merkle tree uh, per se. But uh, one thing I'd say is that there's a different threat, there's a different threat model for um, key exchanges and, and encryption and signatures. So encryption, like the, the key exchange you get in TLS uh, to de define a, a secret that you'll use to, to, to encrypt the session, uh, that you can record and decrypt later. For authentication, the attacks are more um, online. So you need to convince somebody that you have a, to forge a signature, you need a quantum computer now. You, you cannot back break an authentication that happened 20 years ago or 10 years ago. So uh, you would be able to, to forge it, but it, it's been signed with a timestamp. So, um, uh, so what's at risk today that you need to migrate first is everything that uses encryption, asymmetric encryption. And the signatures, uh, we have a bit more time. So don't want to scare all the Bitcoin crowd. I put that on purpose, this logo, <laughs> just to freak out people. But um, it's, yeah, it's, the risk is uh, will come a bit later. Yeah, they still have time to cash out. Um, yeah. Okay, how many qubits? are needed to run algorithm to break RSA, IBM's claiming they can reach 53. Yeah, so it's going to be a lot more. But right now, we're a bit <laughs> in a situation where um, before the invention of the transistor, you know, the computers, they were these big light bulbs and they would break and everything. So it was uh, inconceivable that you could build larger algorithms uh, with this technology until somebody invented the transistor and then everything got smaller, faster, and you were able to scale up quite fast. So we're, we're waiting for a breakthrough like this in quantum computing. And uh, look, my colleagues at Microsoft were working uh, on this specifically, not using the type of uh, physical systems that implement the qubit that, uh, for example, uh, IBM has been using. Uh, my colleagues are working on something called the topological computer that would be more stable and scale better uh, according to their research. So if they're able to build this, that's, that's kind of all taken into, into consideration in the various estimates that are floating around. Uh, okay. it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's really hard to, to predict. It's just we're expecting a breakthrough to happen you know, within a decade that will allow us to, to build these things. Um, okay. So yeah, so these, these 50, you would need millions of qubit to, uh, to build uh, current uh, algorithms and, and it's doubtful that a current technologies used today would be able to, by themselves, be able to build, to scale up to that level. Okay, we'll do one last question. Um, okay, have you looked at WireGuard's capabilities for post-quantum encryption? It might be more relevant than OpenVPN in the future. Yes, so uh, I have not personally. I know that some people did, I saw, uh, recent paper, I forget by whom, uh, that uh, I think they were experimenting, implementing uh, post-quantum uh, into uh, WireGuard. The reason we did OpenVPN, because it was almost free, because they use OpenSSL. So we just plugged in our fork in there, and with little modification, we were able to do that. Um, so uh, some people has been looking at that, and we I don't know if it would end up in OQS if they contribute it at some point, but uh, I think if you just search for that, uh, you, you might get, if you're interested in the, in the details, you can look it up by right? WireGuard post quantum. Or if you want to post the, the paper too in the Twitch chat, uh, that'd be great as well, if you can find it. <laughs> uh, yeah, we have to do the same and search for it. I don't know. <laughs> I, it might uh, be unpublished results. I think we I just discussed that with some colleagues. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Christian. Uh, we're out of time. Uh, we'll give you a big round of virtual applause. It was really great to have you again at NordSec.
Um, before moving out of the Twitch stream, because we're, um, my colleague Flo is going to take the next moderator spot, I would like uh, that we give a big round of applause to our AV guys. Um, I'm just going to post their Twitch handle in the Twitch stream, just because everybody said that what they're doing is awesome. They've been working for like a week on this. I know they're going to probably thank them again later, but I don't know. It's just nice to uh, recognize their work right now and later as well. And uh, well, uh, see you in 10 minutes for another talk.